I'm Sheila Ager, and I'm Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at UW. And I want to extend to you a very warm welcome to our second event of the Indigenous Speaker Series this academic year. The Indigenous Speaker Series is run through the collaboration of the Faculty of Arts with the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center and the Offices of Indigenous Relations and Research, as well as members of the Departments of History and Communications Arts, Communication Arts. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building and it's centralized within our Office of Indigenous Relations. I'm very pleased to note that today's event features the voices of Indigenous members from across our campus, including those from other faculties, as well as from the Office of Research. And now it is my honor to turn the stage over to Savannah Seaton, who will take us through the next stage of our introduction. Bonjour, hello. My name is Savannah Seaton. Um, I'm Plains Ojibwe from Wewisakapo on my mom's father's side and um, Kisikinen on my mother's mother's side. I don't know my father, but um, was raised in Kwakwakiwak territory in northern, um, on the northern Vancouver Island, um, also known as Campbell River. So mostly grew up on the west coast, but I've been out here living in Ontario since 2019. Um, came out here for graduate studies and decided to stay. I have recently taken the position as the director of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center since September. Um, it's been a lot of fun and I've always come and participated by being an audience member and taking in the Indigenous spe Speaker Series um, in years past and it's a really great way to bring people together and and bridge some of these narratives to people who otherwise may not have may not hear these perspectives. So I'm super, super grateful to be here, but it's not about me. So I'm going to take a few seconds to a few moments to um, introduce you to, to, to Talina. So Dr. Talina Atfield is an assistant professor in history here at the University of Waterloo. She is a member of the Ganyang Gehaga Nation of the Six Nations of the Grand River. Previously, she was Curator of Eastern Ethnology at the Canadian Museum of History. Talina's research is grounded in community-based knowledge sharing and creation. She works with tangible and intangible Indigenous knowledges held in museums, galleries, and community centres, with a special focus on Haudenosaunee material culture. Employing faces or seven generations teachings to the study of indigenous cultures held in collections, Talina critically examines the information shared with past researchers and works with community scholars and knowledge keepers to find ways to reintegrate and reinvigorate this information into community practice. Talina's past research has applied a Deo Hade Gaswenta also known as two-row wampum covenant chain methodological approach to the study of Haudenosaunee ash baskets by critically examining the core focus of information shared by basket weavers and community knowledge holders when combined with information published by academics about ash baskets. She has also worked in the critical museology of repatriation and traditional ceremonial care of material and archival collections. Currently, Talina is working with a group of Haudenosaunee scholars on a project called Gash, Gashroni, Gashroni uh, which means to make something, the Frederick W. Waugh Wa Haudenosaunee Collection. Gashroni is a multidisciplinary project aiming to integrate 157 stories, 225 photos, 522 items of material culture, and 50 notebooks collected by F.W. Waugh between 1911 and 1924 <clears throat> for the Geological Survey of Canada. Talina and her collaborators are working on phase one of this Canada Council funded project to translate stories back into the six Haudenosaunee languages and animate 
select stories. Please help welcome me very warmly, Dr. Talina Atfield. Chimingwich Savena, na Ungoa. Um Sego Sewa Grego. Talina Nyong Yats, Ganyang Haga, Ni Wango and Jode. Aswego Nide Wageno. Hi everyone, my name is Talina Atfield. Um, I am of mixed Mohawk and settler heritage with relations at Six Nations. Um, I'm speaking to you today from the Haldeman Tract, the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people land promised to the Haudenosaunee in 1784, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River um, from the mouth to the source. I just wanted to take a moment to be thankful that everyone has made it here, whether you're here virtually or in person. Um, I'm thankful that everyone had safe travels to get here and hope that you have safe travels to get home. And I am thankful that we were all able to come together to have these important discussions today. Um, please know that uh, if I've left anything out in my thanks to just be thankful in your head for anything that I missed. Um, but without further ado, let's get started. Okay. All right. So today I want to talk to you about shifting the narrative around access, use, and repatriation of collections of Indigenous tangible and intangible cultures currently housed in institutions. I'm acknowledging the complexities of collections access and repatriation as a former curator, as well as acknowledging efforts of those who were working to change and implement policy in these spaces. I'm also suggesting that discussions surrounding Indigenous collections access and repatriation would benefit greatly from prioritizing how collections can be used in community over the place of collected origin. So I'll speak to you today about combining and comparing information collected through academic papers and community publications on basket weaving to understand this practice as an important community activity that promotes cultural fluency, community connections, and intergenerational dialogue. Sorry, this is a little far away. Um, so by examining peer-reviewed academic publications and comparing those to community-led publications, discussions, and workshops, surrounding baskets and basket weaving, clear differences emerge between the two avenues of information. Peer-reviewed academic publications place a heavy importance on the origins and genesis of practices of weaving on Turtle Island, most often seeking external sources of inspiration or as a reaction to external events. Community-based communications consist of publications, community discussions, oral interviews with basket makers, and workshops delivered by basket makers. These sources place importance on basket weaving as a critical community endeavor that crosses generational boundaries, provides space for community members to connect, and helps to facilitate individual and community pride and identity through art. It is important that community, um, it is an important community staple that must be protected for future generations. I think this can be said for a lot of different types of indigenous art. We tend to look at art as a separate entity of itself, but in reality, it's inextricable from who we are and what we do as Indigenous people and how we live. So I will start first by giving you an overview of the academic narratives surrounding the practice of weaving splint baskets on Turtle Island, more specifically in the Northeast. So discussions of the, the development of basket weaving in the Northeast place exaggerated importance on a relatively minor aspect of a critically important community endeavor. These discussions have greatly overshadowed the importance of basket weaving in community and the impact of a discontinuation of the practice would have. There are three main academic hypotheses explaining the development of basket weaving in the Northeastern woodlands. One theory suggests that baskets, the baskets and basketry technology originated through contact with European newcomers and didn't exist prior to contact. The second argues that basketry technology existed, but in different forms that were modified as a result of contact. Lastly, 
basketry and weaving technology were entirely indigenous to the Northeast. So we'll talk about the first theory. Ted Brasser, a curator with the Canadian Museum of History in 1975, was the first to present an argument for an entirely external introduction and development of basketry and weaving technology in the Northeast. He argued that wood splint basketry was introduced by Swedish colonists to indigenous people in the lower Delaware Valley around common era 1700. From there, the craft spread to the Great Lakes region through the immigration of easternly neighboring indigenous groups. His primary reason for suggesting a foreign introduction is that groups of Germans and Swedes produced similar types of wood splint baskets in the Delaware Valley around the time of contact. And the Flemish and Germans share the use of wood splints as well as checker and wicker weaving techniques. In support of this theory, academic Frank Porter in 1990 argued that weaving with wood splints specifically came from outside knowledge because there is no evidence that reveals that common production of wood splint baskets or what forms or uses they may have employed prior to contact. Furthermore, Brasser suggested that Haudenosaunee groups specifically didn't produce wood splint baskets until after the Revolutionary War. We have archaeological evidence though. One example, Turnbaugh and Turnbaugh 2014, give us evidence of a plated wood splint Onondawaga corn sifter from New York State that dates between CE 650 and CE 1650 and CE 1670 that may support a Lower Delaware Valley Swedish introduction, but I don't think so. Um, the suggestion that Haudenosaunee people did not produce splint baskets until after the Revolutionary War is likely incorrect, as indicated by this corn sifter's antiquity. The wood splint technique may have originated with colonists, but the Haudenosaunee appear to have been weaving wood splint baskets much earlier than this introduction date. So let's look at some of the technological evidence that predates this theory. Well, twining, for example, is one way to weave baskets. It's argued to be the most ancient weaving method in the Americas. Checker weaving is argued to be the most recent. Virginia Crawford, dates the earliest weaving to some time between 9,000 and 7,000 BCE in the Great Basin of the Western United States. In the Northeastern woodlands, the earliest archeological evidence of weaving is in Atlantic Canada, dating to around 2000 BCE, where six ground slate bayonets revealed impressions of a twine weave chemically etched into the slate by the process of decay. There's additional archeological evidence of twining in the Northeast in Northern Vermont, dating to 1000 to 100 BCE. A twined bag was excavated in Massachusetts, dating between CE0 and 500. In 1609, Lescarbot described the Mi'kmaq carrying fish in plated reed baskets, and he discussed microscop microscopic evidence of cordage, matting, and basketry made of rushes, grasses, cattails, cedar bark, and an unspecified inner bark. In 1724, Laffey Tau described sleeping platforms being furnished with reed mats as well as fur and pelts. And Sigurd Theodat also noted that longhouse doors could be closed with a sheet of reed mats. So weaving, technology of weaving specifically, definitely predates contact. Oh, yeah. Okay, corn husks are woven by braiding the husks and coiling the braid into a container shape. This is a method with significant antiquity across North America. Corn husk bottle weaving is primarily attributed to the Haudenosaunee and in particular, the Onondawaga. The beginnings of the weaving of corn husks are unknown, but are likely tied to the practice of planting and harvesting corn. The earliest archeological evidence for corn agriculture in the Northeast dates to around common era 200 and 500. Early missionary accounts provide details for the use of items of woven corn husk in everyday life. For example, Thwaites notes that early mats were made of corn husks or rushes, which were then put on the longhouse roof and floors. In 1623, Sigurd Theodat noted that corn was dried out and stored in large caches above ground at the ends of the longhouse and was hung on racks the length of the longhouse to dry. 
Several um, examples of more modern mattresses were collected at Six Nations by Wah in 1911. These were newer variants of older versions that were woven to be flat and smooth and were said to be used for sleeping or resting. Some scholars have also speculated that the development of corn agriculture led to the adoption of weaving in the Northeast. For example, academics Frank Lamb and Lismer and Tom McFeet suggest that weaving diffused northward with the spread of agriculture, noting the similarities in techniques, tools, and the divisions of labor. In addition, the term for corn husk can be traced to the divergence of a proto-Iroquois proper from the Huron-Wendat and Wyandat, sometime around 1,500 years ago, meaning the term for basket, or the common modern Iroquoian language term for corn, dates to around 1,500 years ago. So what about linguistic evidence? Well, the term for basket can be traced to the Proto-Northern Iroquoian. This suggests that baskets became commonplace sometime after the Proto-Northern Iroquoian split from the ancestors of the modern Cherokee, which is roughly 4,000 years ago, and before the ancestors of the modern Tuscarora, Marin, and Nottoway split from the Proto-Lake people roughly 2,000 years ago. So this would suggest that the term for basket in Haudenosaunee languages or the Iroquoian language family originated sometime between 2,000 and 400 years ago. So the linguistic, technological, archeological, and historical evidence provides plenty of confirmation that the technology and materials for basket weaving do predate contact. Um, and all of this information was provided through academic sources. So there was a lot of information that we could get from that. The second academic theory is the northward migration of Haudenosaunee peoples from um, Cherokee peoples. So this theory for the introduction of the use of wood splints as weaving elements argues that the technique followed horticulture from the south to the north. Frank Lamb argues that if we accept the northward migration of the Iroquois, Iroquois language family from the south, we can assume that splint basketry forms followed the same route as early cane weaving processes from the lower Mississippi River groups. M. Lismer also argues that the lower Mississippi region was the epicenter from which splint basketry spread northward. She bases this claim on the similarities of the materials and techniques for weaving cane and splint and argues that splint repa replaced cane in the north and the similarities in the materials made for an easy transition. Tom McFeet builds on this hypothesis to argue that basketry diffused alongside horticulture in a northward movement through Iroquoian women. He argues that, this, that it was Iroquoian women who were responsible for horticulture. Therefore, they also likely introduced the tools and techniques employed in basket making to their easternly Algonquin neighbors. In support of this argument, physical correlations for the northern migration theory in the archaeological record would support that, that agriculture and horticulture moved northward with Proto-Iroquoian ancestors out of the Mississippi region and up into Ontario and upper state New York. In 1987, Anne McMullen redirected the academic trajectory on basketry discussions in the Northeast by suggesting that baskets could be thought of as a form of communication that could be used to gain insight into how Indigenous people survived and maintained their identity during times of change. She noted that most basketry studies in the Northeast focused on defining cultural, uh, cultural community and individual styles, but none had truly sought to gain information about the people behind the objects. Furthermore, she argued that studies that focus on definition alone minimize the importance of variability within basketry assemblages because they define variability as, a mean, as meaningless and deny the importance basketry played in communities. She suggests that looking at basket making as a tradition wholly incorporated into indigenous life, rather than one that replaced meaningful indigenous technologies, will allow us to see change rather than deculturation. Hansman and McMullen argued that baskets, like other art forms, can be used to address the historical processes and dynamic conditions that are reflected and commented upon through the art, through art production. They argued that baskets are about society, people, and history, 
But the two recognize this. We need to look at baskets as more than museum pieces and trinkets for decorating sitting rooms. So while McMullen is arguing the baskets are a form of communication, her argument suggests that the messages being communicated through weaving are not necessarily active projections, but rather the result of reactions to specific situations. In other words, the evolution of weaving was a reaction as opposed to a deliberate action. In addition, this suggests that these reactions are being communicated on a large scale to an undefined audience. There are other scholars who approach basketry, like other arts and crafts of the time, in a similar fashion as a response to the pressure of a wage-based economy, um, economic system that replaced traditional means of subsistence. So to quickly summarize um, the, academic, the academic trajectory, um, weaving in the Northeast begins with a strong focus on genesis and origins and shifts to agree that baskets, like other art, ha have deep meaning to indigenous communities, but this is where the discussion ends. Incorporating community narratives to this discussion allows for the continuation of the dialogue and adds a dimension of meaning and importance. Without community input, the dialogue remains abstract and incomplete. So let's shift gears and look at community-based discussions. The primary concern communicated by basket makers for the, um, was the challenges and threats to contemporary basket making. They noted a need to preserve the threatened art form for future generations and to help foster an appreciation for the talent and skill expressed in baskets. The Akwesasne Cultural Center produced a video entitled Master Fancy Basket Maker, Florence Benedict Kajishanawi. This video follows the basket making career of Florence Benedict, matriarch of the Benedict family. The video recounts the intertwining of Florence's life and basket Florence's life and baskets from her childhood through the present. She discusses baskets as a reflection of the way people see themselves within the world and talks about how the preservation of basket making as a culturally significant art form for future generations is of utmost importance. Similarly, in an interview with Henry Arquette, a retired iron worker, he reiterates the importance of continuing the tradition for future generations. Most discussions about splint basketry touch upon this need in one way or another. In terms of the practical side of preservation, Benedict and David of Akwesasne compiled a handbook for the preservation, reforestation, and regeneration of black ash trees in the region. They discussed the decline in black ash trees over the past few years and lay out methods for the reforestation and preservation. This handbook discusses techniques in contemporary nursery practices, as well as traditional knowledge and lessons learned through trial and error. Additional community-led works discuss the deep connection, connections to Haudenosaunee core values conveyed through basketry. Sally Benedict, basket maker and Agwesasne community member, emphasized basket making as an activity that brings people together and creates community. Baskets embody a deep-rooted cultural respect for various elements of creation in the natural world. Sally Benedict argued basket, that basket makers keep the Akwesasne Mohawk culture alive. And she also argued that the meaning of cultural values and concepts about, the li about life are transmitted from the maker through symbols that are woven into baskets. Similarly, Sue Hearn and Ella Williamson, who come from long lines of basket makers in Akwesasne, argue that cultural knowledge is embedded in patterns and convey events such as the creation story and formation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. They argue that the traditional teachings, stories, songs, symbols, and languages are all part of a shared understanding of deeply rooted experience of place and ultimately used to connect people with the knowledge and customs of the ancestors. So we'll just delve a little deeper now into specific meanings behind different types of basketry weaves. So we have a Nihon Intensa, or a strawberry basket. The Haudenosaunee relationship with the environment is often reflected in the weaves of fancy baskets. For example, strawberry baskets are designed to represent strawberries or berries in general. To the Haudenosaunee, strawberries are important in ceremony 
because they are the first fruit to ripen in the spring. It is for this reason that they are considered one of the Haudenosaunee life supporters. When they are ripe, it signals time for a ceremony to give thanks to the creator. Strawberries are also a medicine plant, and the basket becomes a symbol of the strawberry as medicine. In some cases, these baskets may hold medicine or even be given as medicine themselves. Strawberry baskets are also made to acknowledge respect for various elements of creation in the natural world. For example, the strawberry basket is made to be a reminder of our creation story of Sky Woman, who fell to earth bringing tobacco and strawberries with her as she fell. Gagonsa. This means faces in Ganyangeha. And this is a type of weave said to remind the current generation of our responsibility for the forthcoming generations. It serves as a reminder to us to carefully consider our actions and decide how they will affect the coming generations and all decisions that we make. Ganyan Warode, thistle or bird's beak. This weave symbolizes gratitude for the Ganyan Rote as an important fiber and medicine plant. It also carries symbolism for the Haudenosaunee form of governance. There are many pointed issues of contention that can divide the people, but when sitting with a good mind and taking time that is required, there will be a peaceful solution. The pointed shape of the weave represents the pointed or difficult issues. The Ganyan Rode is also a metaphor for growing and learning. As Sally Benedict notes, in its youth, when it is sharp and prickly, the tendency is to avoid it. However, when the plant matures, it releases soft seeds into the fertile ground. The Ganyan Rode plant is also mentioned in the peacemaker's speech to the Confederacy about the great tree of peace. Gachiskayanodo. I hope. <laughs> um, this, means in, uh, this means shell weave. It is a special type of weave that is said to remind the Ganyangehaga of their relationship with the water and all of the creatures that inhabit the waters. The shell weave is also, it also acknowledges the special use of shells such as wampum, which have served as symbols of, of important relationships between indigenous people and others, where alliances could be commemorated and agreements remembered and reaffirmed. Sky dome. This is a motif that is a common visual concept in Haudenosaunee culture. It's on my scarf. Um, it represents a key aspect of Haudenosaunee belief and reveals a great deal of information about the way Haudenosaunee people conceptualize and socially organize the world from the origin story to the ways in which we can live in harmony with the surrounding environment. Celestial, geographical, and mythical phenomenon are represented by the design units that are known as the sky dome. The sun, the horned trimmings, and the celestial or ever-growing tree, and the council fire. This motif features half circles resting atop intricate border lines. The area within the half circle signifies the sky of the natural world. The area above the half circle represents the sky world above from which this world was created. The mounds also represent mounds of earth, where corn, beans, squash, and other plants are planted and grow. The symbol sometimes includes a dish on top of the mound that represents the uh, tree of peace. This occurs mostly in lace work, or as you can see here, the little intricate lines on the top are lace work, or within the visual symbols around it, the second example. So, basket making, like indigenous arts, brings people together. From collecting the materials, to gathering in groups to make baskets, speak the language, and discuss stories of the past, as well as hopes for the future, it brings people closer to the natural world and reinforces that connection. Basket making is an inclusive family activity. The messages contained within are, the, are explained during the weaving process. The story is transmitted visually, but also orally, as a part of the learning process of basket weaving. Baskets also tell stories, according to Henry Arquette. Storytelling is a big part of making baskets. Teaching new generations to make baskets ultimately teaches us about who we are as a people. 
It helps to dispel stereotypes, lift confidence, and help people understand the importance of the teachings of the ancestors. Basket making also provides an outlet for personal creativity. This is shown in the finished products. Concepts are based on how individual, on the individual making the basket sees their world and they weave within their perception what the basket should represent. So one incredible example of this is the Ongwa de Rongoa, or our big basket. In 2017, at the Akwasasne Powwow, a booth was set up where community members could come and contribute at least one weft splint to the overall construction of the basket. Uh, 28 members participated in this. I think Nancy's watching, so there you go, Nancy. Um, this is just, I think, a really beautiful example of the way that art, and specifically basketry, brings people together as a community and how it helps reinforce um, identity and pride. So what does all this mean? Well, I talked to you a bit about what kind of information I was able to get from academic publications. And then I talked to you about the kinds of information I was able to get from community-based and community-led initiatives, aside from publications. Things like basket weaving workshops, uh, speaking with basket makers, looking at videos and things directed by the community. So the majority of the institutional collections of tangible and intangible indigenous cultures have been classified and cataloged based on origins, which is the academic discussions. These classifications continue to play a central role in determining how indigenous cultures are accessed and used. By comparing the, and the prioritization of origins and development of baskets and weaving over community-based dialogues focusing on importance of community building, cultural survivance, and overall community health and well-being, it becomes evident that a critical component of discussions surrounding institutional collections and their use has been neglected. It's critical that we move forward prioritizing community priorities and impact when considering requests for community access and repatriation to institutional collections. There's all kinds of struggles and difficulties surrounding access to collections and there's a lot to take into account, especially from a museum perspective. I know this having worked as a curator for six years. But what I did notice is that discussions of how collections can be used to regenerate, revitalize, and build up community are not part of the discussion when we're talking about access and repatriation. And what I'm saying now is that they need to be. So the next few slides I have are just quick. It's introducing a community-led project that I'm part of. This provides an example of how institutional collections can be used by community members to regenerate lost practices and facilitate community dialogue, capacity building, and connection. Gashroni means to make something in Geoga Ono. This project was born of conversations between Rick Hill and Taylor Gibson at Deo Hahage Indigenous Knowledge Center at Six Nations Polytechnic. This led to trips to the American Philosophical Society and the Canadian Museum of History, where the Frederick Waugh Collection is currently housed. These discussions evolve to include all aspects of the collection, material, textual, archival, and photographic. Not long thereafter, our team was created to compile and recontextualize information related to these important collections of Haudenosaunee archival and material culture, mostly for repatriation to Haudenosaunee communities in an accessible and culturally respectful way so that it can once again benefit the community and the coming generations. We assume that our ancestors who shared this collection, who sold pieces of this collection, who donated pieces, who told stories, who explained things to this collector. We assume that they did this with us in mind because one of our key, um, key cultural teachings is that we need to think about the coming generations. So today, us, we need to think about the coming generations too. And they can't access this, this stuff so we need to make it accessible. We need, to make it, we need to make a way for them to have it and for current generations to have it, for our children, for youth, for our community, so that we can raise ourselves back up. 
So this collection that we're currently working on is comprised of 554 items of material culture, 55 notebooks written by Wa during his time in the communities, 250 images, 157 stories. It was collected between 1911 and 1924 from six nations, Oneida on the Thames, Ganawage, Tonawanda, and Onondaga, New York. Just a little bit about our team. Rick Hill, Taylor Gibson, Kevin White, Tannis Hill, Kira Brandt Birikoff, and myself are all currently leading this team. And here's what we're doing with the collection. So we've started translating these 157 stories back into our six languages. We have 23 stories translated so far. We've just finished audio recording of the stories for animation. We have a rough version of an animation done. Um, we have students creating curriculum using the stories and the collections to put into our schools. We have started creating podcasts, interviews, and short videos. We've also started to plan workshops. We're looking at partnering with other parts in our community like De Ohohage and the Woodland Cultural Center. We're hoping to launch our website in the spring of 2023. This website will include everything I've just talked to you about. In addition, the website will have a link off to a Merkutu platform, which will have everything in the collection available and contextualized. We've also had four gatherings of storytellers. And at these gatherings, we got together, we read some stories and we talked about them. We just talked about how we wanna see these stories come to life, what levels and ages we think they're appropriate for and what we could do with them moving forward. And we've also had a lot of work done indexing the collection for the website. So as far as this project goes, what we're doing here this, this is how a collection really benefits community and how it benefits regeneration and how we give back. But this isn't part of the discussion of access and repatriation, but I think it should be. So that's my discussion for today. I would like to spend the rest of our time together talking with two of my good friends, Savannah and Sarah, at our little kitchen table over here. So we're gonna move over there now. Is it on now? There we go. <laughs> so I will just start by introducing myself. Ani Bojo Kwekwe Kakina, Nishna Mena Mabansawin, Sarah Anderson and Dishnakas, Kitchener Waterloo, Mima Odawa, Nonjaba, Kweyandao, Gawindodem. So hello, everyone. I just introduced myself very briefly in Anishinaabemowin, which is the language that my father's family would have spoken. Um, I said, my name is Sarah Anderson. I hope you're doing well. Um, my pronouns are I, my pronouns are she, her, and I don't have a clan, or at least I don't know my clan. And the reason is because I come from a mixed background. My mom is German Mennonite from this area, and her family was one of the first settler families to come to this area in 1802, 1803, and buy parts of block two and block three of the Haldeman Tract. And so I know lots and lots about that family and that community. The Mennonites are very present here. So I uh, have lots of stories to share about that. But that means uh, I know what it's like to have that big history and that big story. And I can't even tell you my dad's parents' names. My dad was part of the 60s scoop. He was taken when he was four. Um, spent 10 years in foster care, and then was adopted by the Anderson family, whose last name I now have. And so um, a lot of my journey over the past 10 years has been to relearn and unlearn and to reconnect. And so I'm really happy to be here as part of our little kitchen table discussion, because this is how our stories are shared and how we learn. 
So I also just introduced myself more fulsomely just so you know what knowledge I'm bringing to the table. So I'll let Savannah go for it now. Sego. Sego, call it Masayaj. My name's Savannah at Sloat. I work as the manager, Science Indigenous Initiatives in the Faculty of Science here at the University of Waterloo. I also come from a mixed background. So my father's family is uh, Tuscarora and Lenape from Six Nations of the Grand River, where he was uh, born and raised. And my mother's family is descended from Scottish settlers in the Waterloo region, uh, who have been here for a few generations and feel very strongly about calling themselves Canadians. So um, in coming to this discussion, I really think about my experience and identity uh, in the context of uh, the Turo Wampum. So when we look at the Turo Wampum covenant, we think about two canoes paddling the same river, uh, doing so together, but not uh, intersecting or blocking one another's path. And so for myself, I am privileged to have experience uh, in both sides of my identity uh, and communities. And so when I think about the work of Indigenous inclusion, I try and bring uh, both of those perspectives together. Uh, and I'm very glad to be sharing space with these amazing folks and talking about the University of Waterloo and its uh, journey in Indigenization. Oh, Kichi Miigwech. I turned it off and I turned it back on. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I'm so happy to be here and that you've agreed to join me for this discussion. So we do have capability right now to take questions from um, the virtual uh, crowd as well as in person. So keeping track on here. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, so I guess we'll start with that. Does anyone have any questions? I can't see. I'm blind. So you're just going to like stand up. Yes. <laughs> So I'll just repeat the question so that the online folks can hear. So the question was, what got you air interested in this area of research? That's a good question. Um, so I grew up in London, Ontario, and I am Ganyangehaga on my father's side, but I didn't know really anything at all. So I've spent the last 20 years going through Western education institutions looking to find kin looking to find answers, looking to find anything. And that kind of brought me where I am today. But I've always been a very visual and artistic person as well. And arguably that does come through my family. My grandpa is a painter who has murals in the Calgary uh, Tower. Um, and I think he has painting in Polytech too. Uh, so I do come from a family of creators as well. Um, so I started out my undergrad going to Western, just trying to get answers. I moved through archeology span and from there, I discovered baskets. <laughs> and so there seemed to be so much more to creating than what was just on the surface. And so I became interested in baskets and in creating, and that led me to a museum role as a curator. Um, I thought that being a curator would really give me an opportunity to merge my artistic side with what I had learned about myself, about my community, and about my background. Um, so I did that for six years and um, I'm here now in Waterloo because I needed to be closer to community, my family, and I needed to have a different place to have these discussions. I think it's so interesting how the three of us have actually left home and then journeyed back. And that's where we're, we're coming back home to have some of these discussions. I left, I moved to Ottawa to do my master's in indigenous studies at Carleton, because that's where my father's territory is. And then eventually came back here. And I know the stories are similar for, for you too. So very interesting trend that I'm seeing of people coming back home to their territory here, here at this university. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, I think I see an hand. <laughs>
I don't know if I can do justice to your whole question, mm -hmm. but for those of you online, um, about 60 people, um, the question was around porcupine quills and how that material um, has been used and sort of looking at that in addition to the basket making. Sorry, I didn't do your question justice. Um, yeah, so porcupine quill work uh, actually predates beadwork. Um, there's a, a lot of different use of quill work for Haudenosaunee artistic practices. You see the lot, that a lot on the older works on moccasins and bags. Um, is also widely used by Anishinaabe people and as well as um, Wabanaki people on the East Coast. Um, I think it's it was quite common because it was easier to get. I mean, beads didn't come in until around 1600. So um, some baskets, um, mococks or um, birch bark baskets do, they do put porcupine quill work on those. Um, but it's in terms of origins and introduction of that um, specific artistic practice, I'm, I'm not sure. I know that it's very ancient. <laughs> blinding light. Okay. About you, so what do you want to talk about? Uh, I think for me, one of the kind of prevalent conversations from your discussion is thinking about how we include Indigenous perspectives in an Indigenous way. So thinking about, you know, curators and collectors signifying that this is of importance to community, but not understanding the ways in which something is important uh, mm -hmm. or the ways in which we share these things with one another and build connection and narrative and storytelling. And so I am curious to know what you think a, a good way forward is in thinking about how we do this in a culturally informed way. Yeah. Um, did you want to build on that at all, Sarah? I sure can. Um, we just also have a question come in in the chat, so I'll come back to that after. Okay. Um, I also was thinking a lot about uh, institutional contexts, because that's our context here at the University of Waterloo. We're not necessarily a museum, but we are a very large institution. And we have, um, as evidenced by our commitment and ceremony earlier in the fall, we have this drive this interest to indigenize and decolonize. But part of me is wondering how much of those words are our words and what we need, and we being the indigenous community on campus, and how much of that is sort of what the university is saying that we need. Not that I wanna put a stop to these discussions, but I'm still, it's still something that I'm thinking about. And the, the discussion around, you know, the different narratives uh, the academic narrative and the community narrative which really sort of sparked that for me. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the big question on everyone's mind is how do we move forward? <laughs> how, do, how do we envision this or can this be a reality? Um, through my experience, I do know that there are many, many things that have to be considered in institutional contexts before things can be repatriated specifically. And there's a lot of work that's been going on to look at things like sharing authority. Problematic in itself, I think. But um, I, I really think that some, of, some part of the way forward is to just get these items back into communities when the communities want them. Um, all complications aside, <laughs> which ideal, there would be none, and there are tons. But, um, you know, as evidence through the work that I'm doing with Gashroni, most of that collection of 550 items, we can't access it, we can't see it. Of course, there's an open invitation all the time, but that's six hours away. So our kids aren't gonna get there. Um, it would be much better served, I think it would much better serve its purpose if it could come back. And I'm not saying give it all back, but I'm kind of saying give it all back. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just, I think that too long the discussions have really revolved around maintaining the institutional structure and working within that structure. You know, saying as long as we don't, you know, as long as it fits within the way we do things, then we can do it. But that's the problem. 
a lot of these institutions are literally built on our dead bodies. So we can't keep doing things that way. I don't know that we can decolonize these spaces. Indigenization, I think, is something I need to think more about. But I don't think you can decolonize something that's built on our dead bodies. I think the whole structure needs to be dismantled and reassembled in a different way, in a good way. So what are your thoughts on it? That's a good question. We do actually have a question that sort of um, is uh, adding on to that conversation. So what advice do you have for settler occupier museum professionals in creating a safe space for indigenous youth at museums? As context, we have started relationship building with the indigenous communities that surround our museum and want to co-create a project with them in a way that does not cause harm and brings benefits to both parties. And I can say, as I just realized I didn't introduce my, my role here, I work within the Office of Research supporting indigenous research. And I will say more and more, we are seeing these words of co-create and co-lead. So glad to have this question asked. Do you have ideas? Go ahead first. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I do like the discussion around co-creating. I think that it fits well with the intentions of the Churo, or de, de, de Um But I think the best advice that I would have for that is to listen, is to make a space, provide food, and allow people to speak, just to listen to what is needed. You, um, it's very beneficial to not have any expectations or anything in mind if you want to do a project, but to just come together like we are here on our kitchen table and talk about it and things will develop organically. When you start with something, an idea already in mind, you've already um, situated yourself as an authority. So I think it's important to, to come to the table ready to listen with a good mind without expectations and let things develop naturally. Never a bad idea to bring tea and cookies. Um, one thing I'll add in thinking about this, so typically uh, in community, sitting at our table together like this, we just call it visiting. You go for a visit and people come in, people come out. Um, when we think about institutions, whether that's a museum or an educational institution, I find that the expectation is always for um, Indigenous people to go to the institution. So the institution says, we're welcoming you, we want to include you, um, but there's never that reciprocity in going out to visit the, the community or the, the people where they're at. And so I think about some of these projects and where the research will live uh, and who has access to it, as Talena said, and how many folks and institutions are willing to give up some of that authoritative power uh, or that control over research projects or material culture and say, you know, this will live with you and we will visit you. Um, we will come to your territory and we'll access this when you give us permission to do so. Um, which I think is a, definitely a consideration as we're talking about indigenization and what that looks like in a culturally appropriate, culturally informed way. Uh, because for us, our, our conversations happen at a table, not a boardroom. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone has the opportunity to, to speak and visit. And I think that that's something that our institutions can learn from. They're also not transactional. Important thing too, that everyone I think needs to unlearn is that this relationship between Indigenous peoples and everyone else, <laughs> sorry, um, is not a transaction. Originally, treaties were made to solidify relationships, to solidify kinships, and to outline all of our obligations as treaty people in this place. They were meant to be renewed every year. There are meant to be continuous dialogue. Coming to the table and expecting one result and to walk away with a perfect little package is not gonna get anywhere <laughs> because we have to keep coming back to the table. It's a relationship, but we have to keep visiting, we have to keep talking, and, and we have to allow for those relationships to evolve. We have a few more questions from uh, the online folks joining us. So one of them, uh, miigwech, Talina, for your presentation. I was particularly drawn to your discussion of the design patterns and their meetings. 
My question relates to the similarities of Haudenosaunee design patterns with Potawatomi black ash basket design patterns. Do you have any insights to the similarities and the meanings of the design patterns to Anishinaabe or Potawatomi culture? And they are very excited to learn about the storytelling gatherings. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so I know that there are some different symbols that are used in the more um, northeastern part of the United States. Um, they look a little bit different. There's like more straight lines and dots. But uh, for the most part, I think that due to the uh, nature of wood splint, there's only so many shapes you can make with the weave. So you do see a lot of similarities and a lot of um, similar weaves in many different uh, communities. And I can't really speak for what those things mean in other communities. I can only really speak for what I've learned from um, Ganyange Haga people and Haudenosaunee people about what those mean. I think that uh, there doesn't have to be one meaning though. I think that the same weave, like I introduced uh, a Gagonsa or Faces weave, I think that that could have a different meaning in a different community. But the important part is, and kind of back to my overall point, is that it has meaning to the community and that meaning is, is kind of the most important thing, that it can evolve over time and that's what we need to look at most. Are there any questions from the room before I go to another online question? Question. <laughs> the main obstacle to the repatriation of baskets is that baskets don't fall under repatriation policies. They're not sacred, they're not ceremonial, and they aren't necessarily considered of significant cultural patrimony because the importance of baskets isn't part of the discussion. Well, another question. Miigwech Savannah for sharing about that experience. I don't want to, <laughs> hard to re-say that. <laughs> just talking about the money in private collections. <laughs> um, we have another question online. Um, this one's a little bit more, uh, I guess, broad or technical. With the threat to black ash by the emerald ash borer, is there research to find another splint material so basket making does not become an extinct practice? Yes. Um, I'll just quickly answer Savannah's and I'll get to that. Um, so there are laws in the United States under NAGPRA that criminalize looting. I'm not, I honestly, I'm not entirely sure how what that looks like in Canada. I do know that um, museums have and can intervene in private collections. Um, there are a couple of um, funds set up in Canada that allow for things of important cultural patrimony to, um, to stop them from leaving the country. Um, and I know that that has been used before. A lot of these things show up on auction sites. So when you have private collectors, um, uh, and I did see one, this happen a few years back. There were some incredibly beautiful Medeoan related items that came up and they were very old. Uh, there was groups of people lobbying to intervene 
to buy them off the auction site to get them back to the community. So that is something that museums can and are doing. Um, but in terms of things being in the hands of private collectors, the only thing that we can do is try and intercept. So um, it has been before that um, my friend and colleague Taylor Gibson and I have brought it to the attention of the proper authorities on Six Nations when medicine masks come up on auction sites. And I think that we do try to intervene that way when we can, but it's up to the person that owns it. You know, if a private collector owns something, it's theirs. Right, is it? But it is, um, legally. Um, back to the, the other one, was there other things for baskets? Yes, um, there are other woods that can be used. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head right now, they're all in my thesis. That was, uh, was a laborious effort. Um, <laughs> there are other uh, materials used on the East Coast. Um, and I think that uh, we could look into that. It's not quite the same as ash, and it doesn't perform the exact same way. But um, my email's on the website, and I can pull that part out of my thesis if you want to email me. Uh, we have another question. Um, this is, there is such great work happening with community, students, and scholarship in this project, I think Ashwani. Um, and I wonder if you see a role for the local U Waterloo archive and archivists in this work. In some sense, the impulse to archive is antithetical to repatriation, yet the archive itself is a source of co-creation in this instance. So this person doesn't work for the archive, but have been part of some work uh, in the past. That's a question for my team. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Um, I think a consideration for archival work, speaking as someone, my graduate work was primarily in indigenous um, kinship models and identity politics, and so a lot of archival work was done there. Um, I think that we can maybe be creative around what archival work looks like with permission of uh, the community and how they want to be involved. The benefit perhaps uh, is in the record keeping without maintaining the physical material object. Uh, but again, it, def it definitely depends on the narrative of that item and the relationship with community as to whether that would be something that would be included. Um, so I think that, that could be a larger conversation around rethinking um, some of the things we use from a colonial framework perspective uh, and reinventing that. Do you have any thoughts, Sarah? So one thing, because I am not Haudenosaunee, nor do I have um, anthropology or archaeology backgrounds, so one thing that I keep thinking about is looking at our own institution and our, um, our policies, our ways of acting, and our... Um, I've heard the phrase, a Waterloo way. What's our Waterloo way here? And it strikes me that that's not a very um, community-focused way of thinking. And so one of the things that I, I am really wondering about is how our community actually being asked about our preferences and our 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 advice, because Talina's answer to that question was, I have to talk to my team. Is that our default? Is that the Waterloo way? I don't think that's the Waterloo way. Um, so thinking about how do we actually make or dismantle that Waterloo way or make a new way for us to actually be at the center of some of these, these discussions or these policy changes, which I know apparently take like a decade here. It's a very long time. Um, so those are the, some of the things that I'm thinking about right now. I okay. see a question.
So your question is, you want to know where contemporary students at Waterloo can learn these designs? Oh. Oh. Um, I can speak to you about how I came about this journey. Um, so I follow on social media as much as I can about in community events. So I look uh, anytime there's like a basket making event or a bead event or something like that, I go to those. Um, a lot of that information that I found was in community centers. So accessing community centers, talking to people. Um, and I think developing your skills here might be something you want to talk to Logan McDonald about with the Longhouse Labs. Because I know that he and I are having discussions about putting together um, classes where students can learn that for credit. Um, but yeah, in terms of my own personal journey, a lot of it has been hands-on access in collections, which I was really privileged to have working as a curator. So being able to look at um, items in collections, look at how they were made. I, I, did, I did a lot of stuff, I was self-taught on a lot of the stuff that I've done. Um, I am currently an artist in residence for the Bead the Tract project. So I've developed my beadworking over the last five years and I, I can make lots of other stuff too. Um, but a lot of it is self-taught through looking at collections, looking at books, um, watching other people, and talking to people. Oh, I think we have a question back there. Yeah. Um, so the question, are there um, frameworks or models or, th or learnings from your very specific situation here in Haudenosaunee territory to other geographies and um, communities that might be looking to repatriate material? Yeah, I think so. I think that when, um, when we have our website up and running for Gashoni, I think that it would serve as a pretty good example for other communities as to how they might organize and um, approach at least digital repatriation um, because a lot of what we're doing is going to be digital. Um, so yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of parallels there and because um, a lot of places I think are only capable of digital repatriation at this point, most of our discussions are centering on how we can use the digital collection itself. So the stories which have been digitized for us, which is, we're very fortunate. Uh, the stories, the notebooks, anything contained in those and the photos. Um, but I think so, yeah. Um, hopefully we can continue those discussions with other communities that are interested once we're, um, once we're running a little, little further into the future. Question? So the question is for future um, students or incoming students, how, um, what sort of programs or courses or groups that they may uh, be part of to end up working in that repatriation or museum space? Is that right? Did I get that? Awesome. Can you answer that? I can probably start. Okay. <laughs> I can only uh, say one thing, history. But yeah. <laughs> I think that there are definitely uh, a few pathways of consideration. Um, Talena obviously came through archaeology and is now a professor in history. 
I, and myself, I went through anthropology and a consideration was looking at working in cultural heritage and museums. Uh, there are also graduate programs that folks could take specifically related to uh, museum studies, cultural heritage that might be of interest. I think that it's helpful to take an interdisciplinary approach because we are thinking about um, material culture and collections, but it is also issues of cultural heritage and intellectual property that so strongly intersects with identity politics and these um, geographies that we've been discussing. When you think about relationship to territories and items that are removed from territory and removed from community to be collected and then viewed by other people, a lot of that is embedded in colonial practice. And so I think that the kind of modern, hopefully, path forward um, in these disciplines is to think about the dismantling of that colonial practice. So how are we being uh, reflective about the work that we do and the things that we're studying um, when we're entering into that? So I think there are a few academic pathways that uh, someone could consider, for sure. I don't know if you want to add to that, Talina. No, I think that was perfect. Um... I, I'm in the history department. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm still new. I just started in January. And so I'm still um, finding my way around the different programs and the different opportunities. My background is also in anthropology. Oh, question. Dean Sheila was saying we should also consider interdisciplinary paths from fine arts, philosophy, legal studies, potentially to create some sort of pathway for yourself. Very good answer. Much better than mine. <laughs> Anybody else? No. Yeah. No. We have a quilter in our midst um, who was asking about the differences or the different in appro difference in approach to um, more traditional ways of quilting or in this case, basket making or other art artistic practices and the um, intersection with new ways of doing things. Hopefully that captured a little bit. Do either of you have a response? Well, I do know that uh, Sarah is a quilter also, so there's some connection it's there. the Mennonite. <laughs> um, I did not inherit the blood memory for beading or anything. That's my sister. I'm much better outdoors, so I'll let Talina talk about that. Yeah, when I, I guess when I'm looking for patterns, it, dep it completely depends on what I want to do. Um, I think for a lot of, I can't really even speak for a lot of people, but for, yeah, I mean, it's, you can really do whatever you want with art though, right? Like if you want to put in traditional practices and add in new materials, I see a lot of that in beadwork, a lot of different types of beads being added in, people beading literally everything from like Baby Yoda to <laughs> Santa Claus to, you know, everything. I've seen everything beaded. So I've seen a lot of like uh, these traditional techniques merged with new ideas and uh, new ways of thinking are moving forward. And I think that that in itself is traditional. Um, just looking at the, the sort of separation or thinking of something as traditional and something as new or separate from traditional, 
I don't like to look at things that way because I think innovation is traditional. I think that indigenous people have always been innovative and always been pushing boundaries and always building on what they've done before in terms of sustaining during times of hardship, especially with art and through art. Um, when making baskets, you know, about 1860, when the tourism trade starts to explode here, you see a change from plain checker woven splint baskets that are decorated with paint, like potato stamps, to the big fancy weaves that I was showing you. Um, and all of that was a response to the explosion of the tourist market. And many, many people fed their families on their art. Um, so I think that in a way that innovation itself is traditional. I don't know if I really answered your question, but I think it's mostly because I couldn't make my mind understand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will also say for um, for those of you that don't know, Mennonites are big quilters, and I grew up going to quilting circle on Thursday nights at my grandmother's church. So the patterns really did depend on who was part of the circle, and if it was me at five years old, <laughs> or my grandmother and her sisters and her cousins who had been quilting for a long, long time. So even though that was not a, an indigenous practice, in some ways it feels like very like community focused and thinking about transmitting those skills. So that's from my life that I, that I connect with there. It's so hard to see. I can't even explain to you how blind I feel right now. It's just like light, light, light. Is someone hand up? I can't tell. So I know we're just about to the end of our time. So we perhaps have time for one more question before we officially wrap up. Really. <laughs> Again, with the blinding light. <laughs> okay, Kevin. Um, okay, what are some of the obstacles to reclaiming some of artistic practices and art that, uh, because of very complicated um, colonial pasts, were uh, taken or sold? The opposite? Hmm. Ah, okay, what are the supports in place to actually get it back? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who's doing question. the work? <laughs> in, the, in the States, there is a law that you have to be um, a recognized Indigenous person from a recognized Indigenous tribe to label something authentically Indigenous. We don't have that in Canada. Uh, Canada, as far as I know, doesn't have our back for anything like that. Uh, it's just kind of like a... Here's the wolves, fend for yourself. Um, but I think the best way that we can tackle that is to educate people on how to identify things authentically, quote unquote, indigenous. And um, I did teach some of that in my class this semester. We looked at a bunch of links and a couple of the ways that I taught people how to identify is, is there an individual's name associated with the item? Is a community listed? When you look at the item, is there any explanation about how funds are used if there's any donations happening. I know that there are several companies, one in particular is called Kashwan. It's um, run out of Quebec. You'll probably see it in every museum gift shop. There are absolutely no indigenous people that work for that company. And when the owner of the company had been asked to comment on that, they just said, we can make whatever we want and call it whatever we want. So um, you have to educate yourself, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, I, I like that people are interested in learning that and how to do that. So my main takeaway points for you is to anything authentic will have a named artist, an associated community, and if they are supporting a specific fund, that should be named on there and you should be able to look it up. It's 
It's not that the uh, American law doesn't have its problems, though, because if that were to apply in Canada, you'd have to have status for it to apply. So there's all kinds of issues with that exclusion as well. Mm. So I think um, I think that's our time. I don't know if if Sheila is coming back to close or Savannah is. I'm not sure if we're just sort of wrapping up and thinking, thanking you all for coming and listening to our to our kitchen table visit. Oh, sure. You know what? Is this on? Okay, it is blinding. Oh my gosh. It's like you just woke up. Um, that was such a wonderful, wonderful talk. Like I loved how you were up here and you were, you know, just downloading us basically with what you're up to and what you know and um, I learned so much, and then when we shifted over here for this conversation, it was just really interesting and engaging, and um, you know, the questions that came out of the audience and the folks online, the people that have Zoomed in and everything, or I guess teamed in, um, yeah, just learned so much, and I have so many more questions, but uh, we'll have to chat more. So, I mean, on behalf of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center, we're so grateful to still be a part of this Indigenous Speaker Series. You, the three of you did a lovely job, a very beautiful dynamic. I hadn't quite seen that in the past speaker series, so I like that you're, you know, shifting things and making space for the way that you like to do do your work. We're bringing and community I, back. We're taking the focus off the individual, putting yeah. it back on community. And it feels good. Like, and in the audience, it feels good. So I, I really admire all of you women, and um, chi miigwech, big thanks. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>